All right, so this is case five, and this is a uh, thigh mass from a 60-year-old uh, man. And you can see uh, we have a very circumscribed uh, lesion, very sharply demarcated on the outside. And um, from low power, you can tell the first thing you probably notice is these dilated branching vessels. Um, and the vessel pattern here, this has been called the the staghorn vessel pattern or antler-like pattern because the vessels are dilated and branching and sometimes they can look a little bit like the antlers on uh, a deer or something. There you go, There's you can see right there. So they are these dilated ectatic branching vessels. So um, if you're familiar with this, in the, in the olden days, the tumors with this pattern were called hemangiopericytoma, which is basically an obsolete term now. And um, we now recognize that this is a vascular pattern. We still sometimes call it the hemangiopericytic vascular pattern. And it can be seen in what, the, what used to be called hemangiopericytoma is now known as solitary fibrous tumor. And that's what this tumor is right here. But we can also see this staghorn branching hemangiopericytic, so-called hemangiopericytic vascular pattern in a wide variety of other tumors. So it is not a specific pattern, but when you see it, you should certainly think of solitary fibrous tumor, but also synovial sarcoma and a wide variety of other soft tissue tumors uh, can have this pattern as well. So it's important uh, pattern to recognize, but do know that it's not specific. So how then do we recognize for sure that this is solitary fibrous tumor? Well, let's talk about the other features aside from the vessels. Solitary fibrous tumor has a range of cellularity. On one end, you get these very sclerotic, collagen-rich tumors that have relatively low cellularity. Those tend to be the ones that arise like near the pleura around the outside of the lungs. Um, and then the more cellular end, what used to be called again hemangiopericytoma in the soft tissue, um, they tend to be on the more cellular side, okay? The cells, cytologically, the cells in a solitary fibrous tumor usually are kind of plump, oval kind of shape. They're like plump spindle cells, so kind of more oval in shape or fusiform, some people might say, and they range from kind of oval to round. They're usually relatively monotonous because if you, um, I've said many times before in other videos that translocation associated sarcomas and, and non-sarcomas too, translocation associated mesenchymal tumors tend to have uniform cytologic features. The cells all kind of look the same because they all have the same molecular abnormality. And we do now know that solitary fibrous tumor does have a translocation. NAB2 STAT6 fusion is the translocation um, that defines this entity. Um, and you can test for that. You don't have to do fish or molecular. Actually, there's a nice immunostain, the STAT6 immunostain, which is a very nice, crisp, strong nuclear marker that stains the vast majority of solitary fibrous tumors. So that can be really helpful. And these are often positive for, or usually positive for CD34 also. So um, that can help. But remember that CD34 stains many, many different fibrous or fibroblastic type of uh, tumors and proliferation. So definitely not a specific marker. Um, but it's pretty sensitive. Most uh, solitary fibrous tumors will stain for CD34. And there's other markers that people talk about, CD99 and BCL2. I personally just don't find those very useful. In fact, I almost never use CD99 except for small round blue cell tumors when I'm using it as a screening test for Ewing sarcoma. Um, and uh, in the workup of round blue cell tumors, for spindle cell tumors, I almost, I essentially never use CD99 or BCL2. So I see a lot of people do that because it's in the literature, but if you think something's solitary fibrous tumor and you need a stain to confirm, just go straight to STAT6. That's what I would do. All right, but back, I, I got ahead of myself talking about the translocation and the stains. The, the cytologic features, like I said, are kind of these uniform oval to round cells. And they, they are, tend to be arranged kind of haphazardly in what's called the patternless pattern, which means they just kind of all kind of randomly arranged here. Sometimes, though, they can get arranged into little short fascicles or even almost palisade-like structures. Also, in the tumors that are very sclerotic and fi fibrotic, have a lot of collagen, they can kind of create these little tiny cords or little chain-like um, arrangements of cells in between the thick collagen bundles. We don't really have a good example of that here, but these are kind of this haphazard distribution. The other thing is that there's a, is a variation in cellularity a lot of times within individual tumors. You'll have more cellular areas like right here. Slides a touch is a bit old, so it's kind of faded, but still a real nice example. So here, this is a little bit more cellular. 
And then look what happens as we get over here, we get some zones like this where it's a lot less cellular and has a lot more collagen, dense sclerotic collagen, all right? The collagen tends to be prominent around the outside of blood vessels. The vessels often, these dilated vessels often have kind of a thick layer or coating of, of collagen right around the outside of the vessel. And that collagen is kind of oftentimes expands out from the vessel. And so you tend to have collagen rich, low cellularity areas and zones adjacent to these dilated vessels. So oftentimes you'll see that that you'll have like this perfect example. Here you got a vessel and then around it, there's this like hypocellular sclerotic zone. And then as you get further away from the vessel, the cells start coming back in. The collagen pattern can, can be variable. Sometimes it, it tends to be kind of a thick ropey, so to speak, rope-like bundles of collagen. But I've seen somewhere it makes kind of almost a, a florette sort of like starburst pattern. It's really pretty actually. I think the collagen pattern in solitary fibrous tumor is quite, quite beautiful usually. So here, this is a, you know, a nice example of the, the kind of thick bundles of collagen, and sometimes it's dense sheets of collagen around the vessels. There's some more of those ropey bundles of collagen. So that's pretty helpful for a solitary fibrous tumor, the hypocellular zones around the vessels with abundant collagen, the rope-like collagen, the, hypo, or the haphazard kind of arrangement of cells. See, this part of the tumor over here is a lot more sclerotic and a lot less cellularity. So that variability in cellularity I find to be quite useful um, in addition to the vessels and what the cells look like. And some of these, this one doesn't have it, but sometimes they can have mixoid change and it can be really abundant mixoid change on occasion. And those uh, tumors can really um, get mistaken for other mixoid tumors, including some mixoid sarcomas. Also, I've seen some solitary fibrous tumors that have abundant adipose tissue. And I've seen a couple that had mixoid plus adipose tissue and really made me think of like a mixoid liposarcoma or a well diff liposarc that had mixoid change. So um, those are uh, pretty good. I'll, um, I'll have to uh, put some uh, links in the video description down below of examples. I think I've got another video that shows one of those. Very, very tricky. I've, I've almost missed those but thankfully thought of it at the last minute. And here again, look at this real bright, uh, abundant collagen around vessels here and thick rope-like um, bundles of collagen there. So a uh, very, very nice example of solitary fibrous tumor here. And again, STAT6 will be positive. So what about the behavior of these? Well, the solitary fibrous tumor is a little bit of an unusual tumor because it doesn't exactly um, uh, fit into classic benign versus malignant terminology. In the olden days, they were treated basically like benign tumors unless they had high mitotic activity. I think there's more than four mites per 10 high power fields, then you'd call it malignant. And that was the main discriminating feature. In fact, when I was in training, that was the way it was done. And that never really sat well with me. The idea that the difference of one mitosis extra would turn a benign tumor into suddenly being a malignant tumor. Right? I mean, what if I counted my 10 fields and on my on my ninth field, I was at four and then I go to the next field over and there's no mites. Okay, so it's not over, it's not over four, so it's benign. Well, what if I would have, you know, turned right instead of left and I found that extra mitosis, now suddenly it's malignant. So see, I never really liked that. So thankfully, um, newer papers uh, since I was, uh, since I finished training have come out with a, a risk stratification model, which I really like and I'll put links to those those papers down below so you can read about those. And that's what I use when I sign these out in practice. They're kind of are stratified into low, medium, and high risk categories based on a combination of the size of the tumor, the mitotic activity, whether or not there's necrosis and how much, and also the age of the patient. Interestingly, patients over 55, that's a, an extra point towards higher risk, whereas younger patients tend to have uh, be on the lower risk side. So anyway, you tally up points um, and you uh, decide if it goes into low, medium, or high risk groups uh, based on this risk stratification. So it's kind of similar to like what we do with gastrointestinal stromal tumor, GIST. Uh, the same, same kind of concept of, of dividing it up into risk um, stratification. The low risk group basically acts like a benign tumor and essentially behaves very well. I think still that these should be excised with negative margins is the ideal treatment, but the ones that have low risk histologic or microscopic features basically are, are very unlikely to be um, aggressive or bad behavior. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, the high risk group basically behaves like a high grade sarcoma with very high chance for metastases and uh, potential death from disease.
disease. And in the medium group, obviously, it's kind of a mixed bag. So that's an important thing to know about. So I do think every time you get these, you have to do the mitotic count. Um, and in fact, I usually count uh, multiple different, I, I do several, I count 10 fields and I do it in several different slides in the tumor to make sure that I'm finding the most mitotically active area. Um, so in any case, uh, that's the way to approach that in practice. And I'll put, like I said, I'll put links to that um, risk stratification paper by Demico et al. Uh, really excellent paper, by the way. And I'll put those down below. And also I'll include um, down below a template of how I sign these reports out when I when I actually diagnose this in, um, in real life, because sometimes it can be a little complicated to explain things that are not clearly benign versus malignant, right? So anyway, while we've been talking here, I'm just showing you around the tumor more because it's, I think it's such a mesmerizing pattern. It's just kind of hard to look away. Oh, and here, here's an area. And if you haven't noticed, Terrence had to step out for a minute, which is why uh, there's not any talking on his end. So these areas here, you can see the cells are kind of, um, kind of making almost like that kind of cords and chains. Not exactly, but uh, I guess I'll have to put some other examples because just seeing one solitary fibrous tumor is not enough to really capture the whole range and spectrum of features that they can show. But this one I think shows a very nice classic features. And I think it's a good one to learn on and to remember that this is, this is what is meant by the staghorn vascular pattern. And they, and they don't always have to be branching. Look, if I just see big dilated kind of thin walled vessels in a tumor, to me that in my mind, I put in the, the, staghorn like vessels okay and i start thinking of things that have staghorn like vessels or the the hemangiopericytic type vascular pattern and i think of solitary fibrous tumor and again synovial sarcoma and other things mesenchymal chondrosarcoma which doesn't really look like this but does have vessels kind of like it so like i said a wide range of different things and other things that you could think of in the differential especially for ones that had fat in them you can think about uh things like uh, spindle cell lipomas which sometimes are low fat and have like almost no adipocytes those um, can have a very close uh, similarity to solitary fibrous tumor and again stat six will sort that out and also spindle cell lipomas usually have loss of rb1 expression whereas this tumor does not and then um, also occasionally you might think of something like um, if this were close to the skin and there was fat in it, you might uh, think of, you know, dermatofibrous sarcoma protuberans might cross your mind. It usually has more of a story form pattern and not quite as abundant collagen usually or not the same pattern of collagen in, in my opinion. But it does sometimes have staghorn dilated vessels, particularly when it becomes fibrosarcomatous and um, gets like hypercellular herringbone pattern. And those uh, DFSPs tend to have really dilated staghorn vessels um, a lot of the times in my experience. So that's an important thing to keep in your differential if you're in the, the skin or subcutis uh, to think that, to know that sometimes you could have some overlap between DFSP. Um, and again, not this particular example doesn't really look at all like DFSP, but I've definitely seen some where there was some confusion there. So solitary fibrous tumor. And again, remember NAB2, STAT6 translocation and STAT6 immunostain to confirm the diagnosis. Okay, next case.